What wasn't courageous was the IRA's murder of a 25-year-old Protestant woman in Derry. On day 38 of Sand's hunger strike, Joanne Mathers was shot dead as she helped a Derry resident complete a census form. At the time, Republicans were boycotting the 1981 census, but were busy campaigning for Sands. The death of Joanne Mathers, uh, again for many Unionists, uh, drew the, uh, the parallel very clearly. Here are people, they don't care about anybody else's lives. Should we be worrying if uh, those who are in the murder gangs of the IRA decide to, to kill themselves? Uh, they're far better killing themselves uh, than uh, killing innocent people. In spite of the manner of Joanne Mather's death, two days later, on April the 9th, 1980, Bobby Sands polled over 30,000 votes and was elected MP for Fermanagh South Tyrone with a majority of 1,446. Anti H Block, Armagh, political prisoner, 30,000. Yeah! People in Fermanagh and South Tyrone that uh, unionists had regarded uh, as being moderate, decent Roman Catholics, here they were voting for a terrorist uh, and they find that very difficult to, to believe and understand uh, and that in fact uh, increased the divisions within the, the community that people looking at their next door neighbour as somebody who was voting for an IRA man. The Bobby Sands election was a crucial one because there had been for a long time in the provisional movement a scepticism about politics. The provisionals had emerged out of a belief that conventional politics wouldn't work, that conventional politics would be ineffective and that you therefore needed force. That scepticism about politics was partly because politics was seen as being something which would breed compromise. The Sands election victory in 1981 showed that there were at least some possibilities for Republicans of gaining rewards from electoral intervention, from electoral politics. And that was something which made it easier for those in the leadership of the Republican movement who'd been arguing that you needed a more political emphasis to persuade the movement to go down that route. Violence on the streets outside continued as the hunger strike moved inexorably towards its deadly conclusion. When the Pope wished to send someone to see them, to beg them to give up, we gave every facility. Oh no, it is the hunger strikers and those who are coercing them. It is they who have been inflexible and intransigent. It is they who have said, you will starve unto death. By now, others had joined Bobby Sands' MP on hunger strike, and there was no shortage of volunteers. On a one-to-one -one basis, as a hunger striker dies, another hunger striker will take its place. But you're not saying that would go up to the total 440? No, I'm saying that there are 400 potential, 440 potential hunger strikers in long cash. With so many volunteers for hunger strike, cold, dispassionate assessments had to be made as to who would or wouldn't be taking part. Much of that responsibility fell to the man who replaced Bobby Sands as the IRA's prison OC, in consultation with the external leadership. What you looked at first and foremost was people's conviction and commitment to it. And, uh, and, and presumably the, the convictions that they'd, retreat, they'd received in court as well? Well, I mean, in a sense that, uh, I mean, that may have played a factor when we were choosing people. Um, Sometimes people will say, well, okay, I mean, how are you going to get, for example, uh, how are you going to get support for someone uh, who's in, in prison, who's gone on hunger strike, and uh, the British media are going to say, this man has killed three or four soldiers, or, you know, people like Frank Hughes, or people, but, I mean, to us, that didn't, in a sense, it didn't matter that much. It would be more difficult for someone who placed a bomb in a, in a, a shopping centre and, and people have been killed. Well, in, and, in, in, my, in my own personal situation, uh, I had wanted to go on the first hunger strike and my name went forward and there was a debate about it. And I mean, the term comes across, and I've used it, the term is in some of the, the columns, you probably read them in Beresford's book about being a propaganda disaster. Because, uh, I mean, I'm in uh, for killing five people. and. Uh, it is difficult then, in a sense, if people want to propagandize to say, how are you going to attract support for someone like that? Bobby Sands MP was the first of ten men to die, and he attracted international media coverage. Streets and avenues were named after him in several socialist republics. With an estimated 100,000 at his funeral, Bobby Sands had become an enormous propaganda success for the IRA. Men queuing up, literally, to join the strike. 
you know, they were filled with this sense of sacrifice, you know, the, the old 1916 thing came up in them and they were, there would have been no bother putting on another 20 on the hunger strike. In the event, as you know, 10 did die, but there would have been no bother putting on 20 more. There were simply, Bobby Sands, uh, it was inspiration and uh, inspiration and leadership. The British should have been able to recognise that. Three more hunger strikers died before the end of May. Francis Hughes on the 12th, Raymond McCreech died on the 21st, as did Patsy O'Hara, the first of three INLA men to die. In the same period, 21 people died in the streets. We can, of course, maintain and improve an already humane prison regime. But there's no point in pretending that this is what the provisional IRA want. They have remained inflexible and intransigent in the face of all that we have done, because what they want is special treatment, treatment different from that received by other prisoners. They want their violence justified. It isn't, and it will not be. The reality was that by now the IRA felt rejuvenated. We made the point repeatedly to the British government to say, you think you're winning, but you're not winning. Go and look at the wakes. Go and look at the funerals. Look at all the young people queuing up to see these emaciated corpses. You're not winning, you're losing. But of course, they couldn't see that. Republicans saw mass demonstrations at rallies and funerals as support not only for the resolution of the prison issue, but also, crucially, for the armed struggle itself. They were responding quickly to take advantage of their unexpected ballot box popularity. Nine prisoners were to stand in the Republic's general election, Four of them were in hunger strike. Uh, I, I believe there is always uh, in the general, in the mind, the Irish public mind, a wish for a solution of this problem, a wish for ultimate Irish unity. I believe that's as present today as it ever was. And I would perhaps suggest that uh, at the present time, because of the particular tragedies of Northern Ireland, the violence and the bloodshed uh, and all the terrible uh, all the deaths uh, and all the terrible things that are happening, that perhaps the, the wish uh, for Irish unity and for solution of the northern problem that's always there is probably more intense now than it would be at another time. Charles Hockey, who was then in position of power, was not even prepared to withdraw the British ambassador, or sorry, to withdraw the Irish ambassador from London, nor did he attempt to make the hunger strikes a political issue through the general election of June of 1981. Uh, that, was a, that, that, in many ways, was, was quite a traumatic lesson for Northern Republicans to learn. A lot of Southern Republicans actually would have been quite aware of that, but it, re it, it, it starkly illustrated one of the basic facts of life that Northern Republicans, to an extent, were going to stand or fall alone. For Charles Hockey, the bitter irony of the Republic's general election was that the success of two H-block candidates, Kieran Doherty, who was later to die in hunger strike, and Paddy Agnew, contributed to his failure to retain power. As Fine Gael and Labour negotiated a coalition government, Mr Hockey was left to reflect that for the first time since the arms trial in 1970, the Northern Ireland issue had impinged on the consciousness of the Republic in a very tangible way. And just as in 1972, when the British Embassy in Dublin was burned down during disturbances over the Bloody Sunday shootings, the city witnessed a similar violent backlash to the hunger strike. Well, they weren't protesting uh, about human rights. They were attacking our police and trying to burn down an embassy in our state. And they'd come down to the north to do that. Uh, that was a direct attack on our institutions. And they put at risk order in our society. And was, uh, uh, the... Uh, the, the Danger was that because of sympathy for hunger strikers, there might be sufficient support for them to encourage them to continue that policy and destabilize the state. And the first concern of any government is to protect the state. Attempts to subvert the British state continued in the north. The open flaunting of arms at paramilitary funerals for the continuing hunger strike deaths meant Northern Ireland was in danger of exploding. Mass age block rallies were countered by loyalist demonstrations. Nationalists were attempting to, to whip up the, the community to pile pressure on uh, Her Majesty's government. Uh, the more pressure that was uh, piled in that direction, the more likely it was that the government were going to cave in to the threat of the terrorists. Uh, the only thing that was going to slow that process down uh, was the, the acknowledgement on the part of the, the government that if they were to move in that direction, then there was uh, a, at least uh, an equal 
uh, degree of uh, hurt going to be seen on the other section uh, of the, the community. The clock was ticking, more deaths seemed inevitable, and all the time attempts to end the fast brought false dawns of hope. TDs, MPs, priests, bishops, the Red Cross, foreign diplomats, and even the Pope had tried to provide the spark of initiative to broker a deal before the Irish Commission for Justice and Peace sent their delegation into the Mays prison as the 1981 marching season approached. It was obviously a very, very difficult situation uh, because we were talking on the one hand to Michael Allison and uh, he of course uh, was a prisons minister. Uh, he would uh, refer back to Humphrey Atkins uh, who in turn would refer back to Margaret Thatcher. So it was complicated on one side and then when you added the second side uh, which also had its internal complications because you had the hunger strikers within the prison, you had the uh, uh, IRA command structure within the prison, you had the IRA command structure outside the prison and you had the Sinn Féin structure outside the prison. So uh, within each of the sides there was a very complicated structure and then when you tried to operate between the two uh, then it became even more complicated. During a week of intense negotiations, the Commission's delegates slipped out of their West Belfast hotel for a secret meeting with Jerry Adams. They were about to make a startling discovery. While we were discussing the different details of the five demands and so on uh, with the, the British ministers, uh, the British government uh, from London were carrying on a parallel negotiation. And the strange thing was that they seemed to be offering more to Jerry Adams at that time uh, than, than they were offering through, through our particular process. Uh, but it, it was clearly um, a very confused situation and uh, I don't know what the British government were, were doing. The secret talks brought about a gesture of good faith from the British. They lifted the ban on Sinn Féin's publicity director to get him in to see the hunger strikers at about the same time as the Commission was learning about the secret talks. I was told to, to warn them also that this could be the British government uh, involved in major teas to raise their hopes only to dice them to try and break the resolve and uh, I remember Joe MacDonald who was uh, in a wheelchair and was going blind and saying don't worry there's no chance of that happening you just you just keep at it and we'll keep at it in here so I went out to speak to Brendan McFarlane and I was given the telephone as promised and I was on the telephone to Jerry Adams and, and uh, Martin McGuinness who were monitoring the situation on the outside when this particular governor stormed into the room, ordered Brent McFarlane back to the blocks and literally pulled the telephone out of the wall and uh, ordered me out of the prison. Time was running out for Joe McDonnell. It seemed both sides were playing a game of brinkmanship as is clear from this smuggled message from McFarlane on July the 7th to Jerry Adams reveals. I don't know if you've thought on this line, but I've been thinking that if we don't pull this one off and Joe dies, the Ra are going to come under some bad stick from all quarters. Anyway, we'll sit tight and see what comes. Joe MacDonald died the next day, July the 8th, the day the Commission issued a terse statement accusing the Northern Ireland office of clawing back on earlier offers. The Commission of Justice and Peace had found a solution which the prisoners could accept and which the Minister of State of Britain in Northern Ireland apparently could accept. Somebody in London got onto the IRA and brought them into the process and wrecked the whole thing. As it happens so frequently at other times, the British failure to understand how you deal with organizations like the IRA precipitated the problem and led to many more deaths than needed taking place. The hunger strike death toll rose to six on July the 13th when Martin Herson passed on. For Father Crilly, there was personal pain in watching the deaths continue. He wasn't present for the death of his cousin Francis Hughes but another cousin, Tom Michael Wee, was waiting to die. I had this feeling that in spite of all the discussions that were going on in, in the media uh, about the morality of hunger strike and so on, I had this strange sense that uh, Tom Michael Wee was ahead of me, uh, both physically and uh, morally, uh, in a sense that uh, he was so far ahead of me, uh, f prepared to give his life for something he believed in. And even though I disagreed with what he was doing, I found it very difficult uh, to gain the ground, uh, to, to find even the, uh, the, the, the moral high ground, if you like, uh, from which to speak directly to him and to make sense to him in the situation that he was in. They weren't going to get any sympathy from decent people within the, the community. 
uh, but it doesn't take away from the personal courage that must be uh, involved uh, in taking your own life uh, for, for the beliefs that, that you have. Uh, however wrong-headed those beliefs are, however evil those beliefs are. The question of morality was beginning to surface outside the prison. Before the next hunger striker died, the family of Paddy Quinn intervened on July the 31st to save his life after 47 days. The following day, Kevin Lynch died, and within the next 24 hours, Kieran Doherty, TD, passed away. By this stage, Father Fall was talking to relatives of the hunger strikers and challenging the Republican movement to morally justify going on with the protest when it meant certain death. Inside the maze, where he continued to take mass, he frequently had heated exchanges with Brendan McFarlane. And in adapting a strategy where you would have a replacement, you were leaving the pathway open to further deaths. Now, we always believed that there was always potential and a possibility for a resolution. However, uh, no one could quantify it. I mean, we didn't sit down and say, well, you know, we're going to lose 10 people here, we're going to lose six people, we're going to lose four. It was difficult to do that. In fact, it's impossible to do that because you don't know at what stage something can happen. Some mechanism is introduced which allows everybody out of the dilemma, you know, without, uh, with everybody saving face. The protest was beginning to crumble by August the 8th when Thomas Michael Wee became the ninth hunger striker to die and Mickey Devine the 10th, 12 days later. On the day Devine died, the family of Patrick McGowan ended his fast after 42 days. That was also the day that Owen Carn took the Fermanagh South Tyrone seat with an increase in Bobby Sands majority. For the next month, prisoners continued to join the hunger strike while others were taken off by their families. With 10 men dead, the hunger strike as a weapon was running out of ammunition. I put the question to them several times. I said, are you interested in the fast or in death and big funerals? That became a vital question as we went on into August, you know, as I was beginning to take them off one by one. Once that intervention had come on two or three occasions, uh, everybody realised that the power of pressure had been removed from the hunger strikers and placed totally outside the prison and totally outside anybody's control. And that's why a decision was necessary among hunger strikers and ourselves that, you know, this is, this is folly to continue because the next person who dies will die to prove simply, I can die or I can do this. And that's not what it was about. If I'd have been chosen earlier in the hunger strike, very possibly it could be dead now. Um, as, it, as it turned out, at the stage I went on, um, the pressure had moved from being on the British government onto one on the families. And I think that while just in the, <clears throat> in the jail, we were very resolute in what, what we were doing and uh, very focused on that, and it was meant everything to us. It was a different situation for families and outside who were watching us one by one. Their uh, husbands and, and, and sons were dying, and while they could uh, understand what we wanted to achieve and uh, were supportive of that. Nevertheless, they were, they were caught in a real quandary of their love for their, their relative and, uh, and the political objective that we were trying to achieve. The intervention of Lawrence McKeown's family on September the 6th underscored just how far the moral imperative had changed outside the prison. Now the leadership inside began to feel the pinch too. As Brendan McFarlane conveyed in a calm to Jerry Adams on September the 27th, he wrote, there is a growing feeling among those with what I would call a bit of savvy that our present troubles may prove insurmountable. I've been asked to consider terminating the hunger strike. Now that I will only consider when I believe we have no chance of regaining the top position and pushing forward towards a feasible solution. Within a week of this assessment, the hunger strike was called off. Republicans began to take stock. Had 10 men died in vain? I would not do it again because when I went on hunger strike, uh, one, I was doing it to bring about better conditions for the, for the people in the prison, and two, for a 32-county democratic socialist republic. Uh, and so did, so did the rest of the men. Uh, I don't see that there now. Uh, whether they died in vain or not, uh, I think history will tell. History will tell. But... Uh, if there's such a thing as looking back from the dead, and if I had a died, I would have said I died in being, yes. History is written by the victors, or those who are in power. Ve victis, it says in Latin, woe to the conquered, woe to those who are down. 
So you never get a true version in history. It's written by those who win. Decisions made by the IRA's jail leadership had an impact far beyond the wings of Her Majesty's prison maze. Ten Republicans may have martyred themselves to the cause of Ireland, but that was only a fraction of those who died in the streets outside in violence associated with the prison's protests. Yet paradoxically, the prisoners held within these walls were a key element of the political process that led to the calling of the ceasefires. The hunger strikes are a watershed in Republican history and the legacy of the hunger strikes have yet to be fulfilled. The, the legacy of the hunger strikes are ongoing and the hunger strikes did have uh, an effect, an immediate effect in accelerating, for example, the argument over electoralism. But it wasn't planned. I mean, we would still, we would still have uh, got our electoral uh, strategy in place within the party. We would have come round to a position of contesting elections. We would have continued to fight and to uh, win elections as we have done. So the hunger strikes enhanced all of that. I have no doubt about, about that. But the hunger strikes were, were about something different. The hunger strikes were, were essentially about the right of uh, a British government to take up the positions in this country that it took up. I'm not a criminal. I'm a political prisoner. Oh, they must have sent you to the wrong place, son. Sure, there's no political prisoners here. We have only common criminals. And sure, they aren't even house trained. A full-length feature film on the hunger strike for release Name. next year has been co-written by surviving hunger striker Lawrence McKeown. He makes no apology for safeguarding a Republican version of history. He sees art as a sophisticated political tool, not a crude caricature, and stands by the integrity of his work. The legacy of the hunger strike is that um, people um, came through something, came through it not unscathed, um, but learned a lot from it. Uh, I think that the scene, uh, on the terms of the outside, it was recognised that there was uh, maybe a different way of pursuing the, the struggle than I think that, uh, although Sinn Féin would have been developing as a political party anyhow, I think it speeded the whole process up by about 10 years, that, uh, that it moved from a focus being on, a, on an armed conflict, which was a very small group engaged in it, to more one of mass protest and, and, and politics and, and utilising politics. If they're going to be using the hunger strikers as a tool to bring about uh, a constitutional situation in Stormont, then I believe that is, that is wrong. I don't believe hunger strikers should be used uh, as a tool um, to bring about or to, to help uh, re-establish Stormont. I don't believe that is morally just or morally, morally right. I think it's wrong that they should be doing that. We would like everybody to sit back and analyse and look and uh, to support progressive ways forward. Um, if, if family members of hunger strikers are either disappointed or disillusioned, it's unfortunate and uh, it's regrettable. The hunger strike was a defining moment in modern republicanism, shifting the focus to mass support under the direction of a northern leadership. With that same leadership in government in Stormont today, the choice was ultimately between the ballot box and the Armalite. A fact acknowledged by the man who coined the phrase at the 1981 Ardèche, held in the immediate aftermath of the hunger strike. In a sense, I was playing to uh, the militarist gallery that were worried that uh, once again politics was going to uh, take over and there's going to be a major dilution in, in the approach. And I just wanted to assure them that I thought it was possible for the IRA to wage an armed struggle and Sinn Féin to simultaneously uh, take part in electoral politics, of course. There was a ceiling to the amount of support that Sinn Féin uh, could reach under those circumstances. I am someone who's been involved in Republican politics for 30 years, and I understand the reasons why uh, that Sinn Féin has now entered into electoral politics and have gone down, the, gone down a path which has taken us into storming, but will, will ultimately advance this struggle so as in 10, 20 years' time, when history can judge this particular phase of the struggle, it will be seen as, as a vital stepping stone towards a united Ireland. But the political status that they have now uh, is of course much greater than the one that they even themselves sought. Uh, they now have been uh, elevated. Uh, terrorists have been gentrified. Uh, they are now the leaders of this uh, community. Uh, people who believe in democracy, people who 
utter the lines that terrorists should not be allowed in, in government. Those people are described as warmongers. Those are the people who don't want peace. The whole table has been turned. The terrorists are in the ascendancy. Uh, that's what government has done in Northern Ireland. At the end of it, not only did the prisoners get their five demands, but they effectively got an amnesty when the British government, and in in probably in the most public acknowledgement of their political status, released them. Nobody worries too much about the 60 outside. That's one of the tragedies of it. There's no plaques up or statues or memorials of the 60 were killed outside. That's, again, the inequality and disregard for their human lives. That's, that's offensive. The hunger strikes of 1980 and 1981 may have profoundly changed republicanism by creating a greater emphasis on electoral strength. But another important lesson was that negotiation, not the threat of death, provided the impetus to end the prison conflict. The unfortunate reality, even today, is that not everyone has absorbed those implications.